It's an elegant day here at Texags Radio, and this is Texags Rewind presented by Yeti. The reason for the nice clothes is because, you yeah, know, we got a Mike Elko press conference that we're super pumped about. Nick, uh, you were around for the last, I don't know, 72 hours every day doing something here at the studio. How crazy has it been? It's been crazy, but it's been fun. Every time I was called back up to the studio, I knew it was going to be some fun news. So, uh, yeah, just kind of excited. It is wrapping up. We're going to get a press conference later today, but i um, excited to see how Coach Elko puts together his staff. And my gosh, we got a whole off season to talk about it. Yeah, we do. Jared, what was your favorite part of the show? Besides the head coaching news, honestly, Buzz Williams' interviews are always the best. Uh, I just love hearing him talk, his enthusiasm, the way he praises his players. It's always great. All right, so on the show today, on this Rewind, you're going to hear OB and I go back and forth on the hire that is Mike Elko. Tom Hart, SEC Network, getting that national perspective on the hire as well. Buzz Williams, as Jared told you about. And, uh, oh, that's right, the owner. I was about to call him Mike Lucci. No, Billy Lucci talking Mike Elko here on the program. That and more, it is Texas Rewind. Check it out. People want guarantees. There are no guarantees. Are no guarantees. You got the guy from Alabama, and everybody celebrated, and the regions were high five, and it didn't work it out. You got the national championship coach of Florida State. You had some success, but he was too stubborn to admit his or acknowledge his own shortcomings, and it didn't work out. You got the up and comer from Houston. It didn't work out. You got the guy from the NFL. It didn't work out. There are no guarantees. But when you look at Mike Elko, I would contend there are no negative aspects, none of hiring Mike Elko. No, no, not, not one thing could you look at and say, yeah, but oh yeah, but well, yeah, he went seven five. He went seven and five at Duke. You with his quarterback me, down. With his quarterback down. You tell me how many times in a season Duke lines up with the equal, at, at least equal talent to the team they're playing. Yeah, hundred percent. That is that. Duke is Duke even Vandy? Like I don't know. Like I mean, they're, not they're, recently. If well, under Elko, they're better than that. Right. But over the course of a long period, uh, say the last twenty years, they may be. At the very best, in my opinion, equal to Vandy. David Cutcliffe had a little bit of a he nice had, run. He had a right? nice run. But and then before that, you had to go all the way back to Steve Spurrier. Spurrier. Yep. And everybody else failed. And I remember I was watching the Luchador, and y'all couldn't come up with David Cutcliffe's yeah, it, name. I had to remember he, he was after. saying Deputy Dog. Deputy Dog, yeah. But uh, and, and David Cutcliffe is a heck of a football coach. He is. Um, so it takes a he- – he- that's just it. Steve Spurrier, one of the best football coaches of all time, had success at Duke. David Cutcliffe is a heck of a football coach, had success at Duke. You have to be a next-level football coach to have, to success, have success at yeah, Duke. You're exactly and Mike right. Elko did. But it might have worked. I just didn't love it, and our fan base absolutely didn't love it. Well, first of all, right, I mean, they reach – their conclusions based on their history with the program. And that's something that an outsider can never, I don't think can ever walk in and say, no, no, you guys are, are, are doing this wrong. You're feeling the wrong way. I thought it was a good hire. I thought it was similar to Elko and a very high floor. And at A&M, the ceiling will always be the talent. The, the ceiling to me is not tied into who the head coach is. The ceiling is tied into, you know, can you develop the talent that shows up? Can you continue to get the talent? Um, uh, obviously, Jimbo's stubbornness was a roadblock in, in many ways, but um, I, I thought students would, would have brought a guy in who knew the conference well and knew how to build from the inside out, and they already have you know, a, a lot of the pieces in place right there. I think it was really interesting in talking to a lot of people in Lexington about how all this went down is what makes Mark Stoops a great coach at Kentucky for people that are around him. And he's built that program into being something that is so appealing that, from what I'm told, numerous people wanted to stay behind and try for that job. So I think there was a challenge for him to con- convince his uh, offensive coordinator, Liam Cohen, Vince Merrill, his number one recruiter, to come with him. Today. I think they, they looked at it and said, well, why would I leave and take on the challenges and the frustrations there? We're building here, and, and I could maybe be the head coach here. Um, and I think that was certainly part of it. But Listen, the the idea that anybody is a is a lock to win a national championship is um, that's just folly. You know, you you got to get the guy in who, who you believe in, and uh, I think Elko and students are very similar in that way. So once again, it's a, it's a solid solid.
solid hire. Wade struggled to shoot a little bit, but you had the grit, especially at the end of the first half and the way you all finished. Yeah, I just think that it speaks to our guys. And uh, like I mentioned yesterday in post game, I, I think they're a reflection of the people that raised them. Uh, I, I think that a lot transpired. Obviously, we were the first game of the tournament. We were the last game of the tournament. Uh, we got there on Tuesday. Six days is a long time to be in one hotel. And um, I thought all of the things that transpired, the good things and the bad things, I thought the response of our group collectively was very, very good, considering it's the third week of the season. Uh, I thought there were multiple guys yesterday who were the best they had ever been. And those guys all had to be the best they could be in order for us to have a chance to do what transpired. And I don't think that we were great in a lot of respects, but I think in some ways uh, what transpired the last 24 minutes of the game was in the end what we have to be about. It's for sure not always the funnest or the prettiest, But I think the identity and the roots and the foundation of what we have to be about at Texas A&M basketball, I think that was uh, on display by everyone that played uh, the last 25 minutes. Buzz, that that was yeah. First of all, that was a fun a fun weekend to watch. uh, All all three games actually. You're welcome. did you watch them, Lucci, or you were busy doing other things? I actually, wa- I actually watched, but I was also busy. So, luckily, uh, the, the timing. So you, you, you watched it. What it was on mute. Yeah. Well, the, uh, the I, there was a couple stretches where I muted it because I was like, "This is uh, <laughs> that decision for for Mike Elko to leave," and I'm sure he'll talk about it today. Was incredibly difficult. Like that was not. I don't care that he's getting a raise. I don't care that he's coming over here with this loaded, talented roster and the unlimited resources and stuff. Yeah, ultimately, those are the type things that push you over the top. He loved living in Durham, yeah. coaching at Duke, uh, what they were able to do there. I think he was so connected to it. But that was also the way he felt here. You know, he coached here for four years. When he left, his – I. I I don't think, I know, when he left, had to be his dream to say, man, one day I would love to be back as the head coach at this place. One day probably came a lot sooner than he expected. And I don't think he planned to leave Duke after two years. I believe he could have had the Michigan State job had he wanted it. I believe he could have had the Mississippi State job had he wanted it. And his name never came up for that one. But he could have had jobs like that. I don't. He would not have left Duke for that. Just like when he was at A and M, and he did not leave A and M for multiple head coaching jobs, but he left for Duke because he loved that opportunity, he loved that part of the country, um, and it fit and it worked. And unfortunately for Duke, just like for A and M with a lot of these basketball coaches, it worked so well for him that he parlayed that into kind of going out and getting that dream job. Right, and that's what it is. And and. I get it on the Duke side. It makes me feel even – not that I needed to, but I feel even better about the Elko hire when you see how, you know, bummed and upset and, and borderline pissed off the Duke people are today. Yeah. That you always want that rather than the – Good, take them. You know what? And I'll say this. You're not hearing anything negative. You're not hearing anything negative. Not that I would expect that, but you're not hearing people go, well, you know – Underneath, it really wasn't, you know, there was yeah, a yeah. culture issue or there wasn't stability or there wasn't, you know, it was not going to be sustainable what they were doing and coaches were going to leave and players were going to treat. You didn't hear a lot of that, any of that actually uh, coming out of Durham. Nick, tell the people what to do and while you're doing it, also tell them how crazy our YouTube numbers have been recently. They've been really uh, crazy and really good. So if you could keep liking, subscribing, commenting, we really appreciate uh, all of you, even if you're not Nagy and you're just checking out, um, you know, any A&M news. We talk a lot of national college football. We're getting into basketball season, so we'll start breaking that down as well. But, uh, yeah, I think I covered my basis there. Help the algorithm. Help it. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you next time.